Hello there, my name's Tom Booton. I'm the head chef at the Grill at the Dorchester uh, in Park Lane in London. Uh, so today we're going to do a really beautiful Cornish cod. So we get the fish from a company called Flying Fish in Cornwall and it gets delivered every night. So I place the order just now, so 9 o'clock in the morning I place the order. The driver leaves, Lund uh, leaves Cornwall at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and they get to us for about 2 o'clock in the evening. And then they do loads of drops off in London and then they drive back. So that's every day, so it's fresh day boats, so it's sustainable fish. It isn't farmed fish, it's sustainable day boat fish. Cod has to be fresh because when you you will you will see some types of cod through if you go and look in Waitrose and you see the cod what they have in Waitrose or any of the supermarkets sometimes you can see some of it is really beautiful but you can see sometimes the fish hasn't got the perfect flake or the pearl we like to call it of the beautiful color and you'll see that later on when we prep the whole cod and you can really see the difference but again fish is very expensive and the, the when you eat it the texture of the fish would almost go a bit cotton woolly we like to say so it can be a bit almost chewy. The thing is we actually brine our fish as well. So we get the whole fish in, we get whole animals from pigs to lambs to cods to all different types of fish. Uh, we take it off the skin, which I'm gonna show you later, and then we brine it in a 10% salt brine. So a brine is water and sugar, uh, water, sugar and salt. We bring that to the boil, we make it once a week and we keep a massive six litre tub in the fridge. And then we just brine the portions of fish for about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the size. And what that does, it really firms up the fish so when I pan fry it, it means it doesn't fall apart. Sometimes when you cook a bit of fish, especially if chefs do it with the skin on, you'll see the flakes all flaking off. Where with this one, you'll see the fish will keep beautiful and strong together. And also it penetrates the seasoning of the fish as well. So you're, you're doing it for two different ways. It's taking the moisture out of the fish, it's seasoning the fish, it's firming it up, but also from a health and safety point of view, you're actually killing some parasites as well because the salt is curing it as well. So it's good for many different techniques really, but you, we brine everything in the kitchen from meat to vegetables, we brine hispy cabbages. It just really penetrates the seasoning, gives it that beautiful salty, but not over salty flavor. Uh, so the dish with that will be the beautiful cod. And then we've got these really stunning sand carrots, which are grown in sand, so they become super sweet because the dryness of the sand really intensifies the flavor of carrots. So on the bottom, we've just really simply roasted some carrots. And then through that, we've mixed some lilliput capers, the tiny little bits of capers where you, when you eat them, you get the pop of flavor. Uh, that's on the bottom, fish on top. Then on top of that, we've got a beautiful carrot salad. So it's the sand carrots again. We've just really simply beautiful peeled them, almost like papilladelli tagliatelli pasta type. And then we pour a hot star anise pickle on top. So they're semi-cooked. They still have a bit of texture, but they are cooked as well. That's on top. And then we've got some macadamia nuts and some Brazil nuts. Uh, and then the sauce to finish is from the, the bones of the cod and some from the juice of the carrots as well. So we juice the fresh carrots, we have the roasted bone stock, so the fish stock, and we reduce them down together and then we monte that, which means thicken with butter. Uh, and then we add a little bit of Chardonnay vinegar at the end. So it's really simple, really delicious, fresh sauce. Not too sure really, I think I had the idea during lockdown and it's quite of a weird one as well because carrots and capers I've never actually seen before and when I did it all of my boys and girls in the kitchen were like oh I'm not too sure about cod and carrot, uh, capers and carrots but now we absolutely love it and yeah it's super simple I just like really clean flavours and carrot so for me we all know what a carrot tastes like but when you've tried a sand carrot or you've tried a heritage carrot a really stunning flavoursome carrot there's a difference between the carrots you buy in the supermarkets so it's about getting the best produce you possibly can. So I try and get the best cod I can get in the country, which we do have amazing fish around us as we're an island. Uh, I try and get the best vegetables I can get from my suppliers and we just simply prepare them, but with 110% respect. Brittany, yeah, they're from the top of France, so Brittany. They're very famous for that, yeah. Well, France has amazing vegetables. The Rungis market is like, massive it's about six six times the size of billingsgate if anyone's ever been there and it's absolutely ginormous and they really pride themselves on some of the best vegetables but also we do have great vegetables growing here as well
Well, I guess for me, with the capers, I love capers. We actually put them in quite a lot of stuff, most probably too much stuff. But the idea is when you eat the caper, you kind of get this pop of vinegar and the salty kind of taste of a caper, which it has while, while you're eating the dish. And then when the caper season is around, we do go and pick our own capers in Hyde Park and we salt and vinegar them as well. So we make our own too. But yeah, it's a great, it's a, for, it's a beautiful product, but also it's kind of a seasoning at the same time. And seasoning for me isn't just salt and pepper. Seasoning is also vinegar. So I like, for me, it's like the perfect seasoning because you've got salt, you've got vinegar, and you've got the pop of flavor. Well, I do normally use Brazil nuts, but Rebecca from Chef's Forum said I had to put some uh, macadamia nuts on there. But the Brazil nuts just for texture, but also you need that nutty kind of flavor in your mouth while you're eating because you've kind of got the soft carrot at the bottom. You've got the carrot salad, which has a bit of bite. You've got the cod, which is kind of translucent and succulent, but then you need that kind of nutty flavor, which just kind of gets the back of your throat going a little touch. Nuts with fish, nuts with a lot of stuff. We do another mackerel dish and we always, I always kind of put hazelnuts with beetroot, but I do really like using nuts as well. Uh, the one we do in the kitchen the most with pecan and walnuts is we cook them down in a stock syrup, so sugar and water, until they're nice and glossy. Then we deep fry them quickly and season them with mold and salt from Essex. And it, they just really, they give that beautiful nutty flavor, but that crispiness and that texture. When, you, when you're making a dish, you need to think about textures of the dish. You can't just have everything soft, 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 soft. You need to have something which is vinegary, kind of seasoned, fresh, pop tasting flavor, and all of the rest. Yes, it's on our a la carte menu, yeah. So I think last night we sold 15 portions, so yeah. So this cod is for lunch, for dinner service tonight. For our main course size, we charge, so it's very different here. I didn't want to do an a la carte set price. So not every starter has a different price, not every middle course. So here at the grill, we do a four course menu. So basically the first course, and we call it first, second, third, and fourth. The first course is something really light and fresh and really getting your palate going. Uh, the second course is what I kind of call the dirty course. So on that, we might have the prawn scotch egg, which is like really rich and like tasty, delicious. Uh, we've got another sweet bread one, which are really rich, heavy dishes, but small enough that you can just really enjoy it. Then the third course is your main course. So that's where the cod, that's what the cod is on. So, and then the fourth course is the dessert. So we break it down. So my menu costs 65 pound for four courses and we break it down at a starter is 10, then it's 15, then it's 35, then it's 10. So from third, fourth, uh, third, second, third and fourth. So that means the main course would be 35 pound, which sounds like a lot, maybe for some people, but when you break down that a portion of cod costs me around six quid, then I need to make some money back on that. The carrots cost five pound a kilo and we go for about 20 kilos a week. So you can work the maths out there. And then Brazil nuts, a bag of Brazil nuts is 17 pound a kilo bag. And we only get kind of 25 portions out of them. So when you actually, it might sound like a lot, but when you break everything down and then you try and, you've got to pay for me, you've got to pay for the team, you've got to pay for the front of house, you've got to pay for the beautiful room, the glasses, the washing up. Uh, so there's a lot of elements what go into costing stuff and how you have to do that. So I made, I made it very hard myself by making it a, a set price menu because it means I have to average it out all throughout the menu, which sometimes is very tricky. I was very cocky at school. <laughs> so I'm an Essex boy, very cocky, still am a little bit now. <laughs> uh, but. I got sent to a really beautiful restaurant on the Essex Suffolk border called The Tollbooth, which had three rosettes at the time, used to have a Michelin star back in the day. A uh, really beautiful site owned by the Milson family. It's been there for 67 years now, I believe. Uh, and yeah, I just did my work experience there and then fell in love with it really. Uh, and then I started doing Friday, Saturday, Sundays after school. Uh, I was most probably, and I had a paper around Monday to Friday as well. It was most probably the most money I was ever on. Uh, and then I just kept working. Then the day I left school, the executive chef, Ian Rhodes, said to me, Tom, you either go to college or go to university, or you can come and do this full time. So I took my first job. I think it was something like 9,000 uh, pounds per annum. And yeah, I stayed there for four years. Uh, I did all the sections in the kitchen. That was where I learned the, the basics of cooking. Then after that, I moved to France for a year. Uh, lived in Val there, so I kind of did a ski season when all my friends were going to uni because I was still at home working very hard, working 80 hours a week, really pushing on. Uh, and it wasn't easy. I used to go home and cry to my mum a few times, I'll tell you that. Uh, and then, yeah, lived in France for six months, still cooking at a high level. Come back to England and then my old sous chef worked at the Berkeley at the time at the Boxford, uh, which was Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, which is no longer there. 
and he knew of Alan Williams who was opening his own restaurant inside the Westbury. So I just rang up Alan and I got a job there. Uh, worked a year for him there from 2012 to 2013. Uh, and then after that, I went to work for the Lorch Pierre and Pied de group. Uh, I did three and a half years with Andy McFadden as his, well, being his sous chef for the last two years. Uh, and then I needed a little break from London, to be honest, because it was not that it was stressful, but I just worked for 10 years of my life really hard. So I needed a little bit of a break. So I went to work in New York for a few months, all for free. I didn't get paid for it. So I was in New York for two months. Then I did Iceland for two months in a beautiful restaurant called Dill. Uh, and then I did Copenhagen for two months as well. So I basically took six months out, got in contact with all the chefs I've met and people I knew, and I just really traveled. I got offered jobs around the world as well, but I knew I wanted to come back to London because that's where my heart was. So then I come back and I was offered a few jobs back here in the UK, out London, inside London. And then uh, Oli Dabu offered me sous chef at Dabu restaurant, uh, which was a really amazing little restaurant in Fitzrovia, which is no longer there as well. But Oli was a, is a legend because he was, I think at the time and most probably now, he's, he's the only chef who actually owned his own Michelin starred restaurant. He actually owned it and it was in Fitzrovia. And he taught me about money and about how much it costs for cancel to come and pick up the bins and how much it costs to pay the water bill and how much profit you make on a tasting menu. And it sounds like a lot of money, but I remember at Dubu, I think our tasting menu was 90 pounds. And I think when we worked out, our profit was something like one pound 14. It was minuscule, it's really, really tiny. These margins, these restaurants work in, and, and this kind of restaurant, the small money we make as a profit. Uh, and then after that, Alan offered me head chef back at Alan Williams at the Westbury. So I did uh, three years with Alan back at the head chef at the Westbury. And then uh, randomly one day, the hotel manager from the Dorchester come to eat wanted to meet the chef, I uh, went to meet him, and that was it really. And then the story of the Dorchester kind of evolved. So me and the Dorchester have been talking since two Novembers ago. So it took a year to plan it, to work out what we wanted to do. Uh, and then, yeah, they've been very supportive with me and they've let me kind of run with it. I've got an amazing team. I think I've got, I've got 14 chefs and I think eight of them have been with me for three years minimum. So we have a really strong connection in the kitchen, boys and girls. Uh, mix front of house here as well. We've got a beautiful team. We've got Jen uh, who's the general manager Then we've got Pia the assistant manager and we're really we're really striving at the moment. So since lockdown We we only opened on November the 12th So we were open for five months and then lockdown obviously shut us down So we were closed for six months So we were closed longer than what we were open which was pretty depressing after working on the project for a year And then now we're back and running we've been open for nearly a month now and yeah, we're absolutely loving being back we just want to keep up this energy, keep up what we want to do and what we want to achieve in the next year. And then, yeah, it's good. But it's hard work, not going to lie. <laughs>